Packet Bell was a well-known name among home computer users in the 90s. Many homes were adorned with a machine from the manufacturer as they rode the wave of popularity bringing computers to the masses. The multimedia explosion, thanks to the space afforded by the CD-ROM, was here, and Packet Bell was right in the middle of it. As part of a lot I found locally a while back was this gorgeous Packard Bell PV2980 tower. Let's take a look at what's inside, what's up with all those filled drive base, and of course, play some games. Welcome back to Rick's Random Retro, where we like making waves. So as mentioned, this is a Packard Bell PB2980, which I've managed to find surprisingly little information on. That it said, it may not come as a complete shock as many of these sort of home-targeted computers had uh, minor model number differences and series so that retailers could avoid honoring requests for price matching. If the numbers don't match, it's not the same computer, right? Sorry, I can't price match in that case. If you happen to know what the uh, story is on this particular version, drop a comment below and let me know. Now, as for the actual model number on the back, there may be a clue as it's instead listed as a A940TWR. Now, this number does appear more frequently and seems to have been shared by several other models, which are at the very least similar, even if not exactly the same. Pacmate, Multimedia, and Legend are some of the ones that popped up when I looked into it. The basic framework of this machine appears to have been tweaked and sold with different retailers under different model names. A lot. It's a handsome machine, very much a product of the era, and while I didn't have one myself, I think it is nostalgic for many people who did. A friend of mine had an earlier desktop model of this, and I remember spending many evenings playing games such as TIE Fighter well into the morning hours. As for the specs, we have a Pentium 150MHz processor and 80MB of RAM. Included is a 1MB S3 video card as well as an Aztec Soundmaster compatible sound card. Storage is handled by a 2.4GB hard drive together with a CD-ROM drive and a floppy drive to run it all out. With some obvious additions here, as we'll get into in a second. Most of it appears to be part of the original spec, apart from the memory. Otherwise, this really is a very typical setup for the day, and a ready computer in the box sold by many different manufacturers of the day. I had a similarly comparable machine instead from AST, and I'm willing to bet many of us did as well from a range of companies. The home computer revolution was truly taken off around the time this machine was made. So what's up with all the drives here then? Because that is definitely not a standard configuration. Well, it's simple enough that the gentleman I bought this machine from wanted this to be his DOS and Windows 95 machine, for which it's very well suited of course, which access to all sorts of media. And well, let's just say he accomplished that. Besides the standard CD-ROM drive and 1.44 megabyte floppy drive, we also have a 1.2 5 and a quarter floppy drive and an internal 100 megabyte zip drive. That's about as maxed out as you could have gotten for the era, short of maybe a burner or something along those lines. What it does give us is basically free reign to use just about any media we want for games or for transfers. Handy, and looking at the tower, the stack would have been a dream come true for many back in the 90s. I remember myself fantasizing about putting additional drives in my AST to fill up all the slots. I didn't need to, but one could dream, right? Well, that would have looked so cool, and here we are living a dream right now. Oh, and yes, all the drives do actually work. Let's open this thing up and take a look inside. I'll uh, admit it didn't become immediately apparent to me how to open this thing up. For all of you with plenty of experience working on this case design, now would be the time you point and laugh at me. However, I finally did figure out that the screws that prevent access to the interior of the case are located on the underside and the whole panel on the side pops off after those are freed. Easy, and definitely got it on the first try. Right.
The sound card is a Packard Bell OEM variant of an Aztec Washington 16 model, obviously with a modem baked in as well. Something I'm fairly sure was typical of the day to condense and reduce the need for additional expansion cards in these pre-builds. Above all, it provides Sound Blaster Pro 2.0 compatibility and a great sound in DOS thanks to the real OPL3 chip on board. Take a listen and see what I mean. Say what you will about external MIDI devices, but sometimes you just want good old OPL music. Once you've extracted the wavy accent panel, removing the rest of the front part of the case becomes obvious thanks to these two screws that are in plain sight. Once those are removed as well, the entire front panel pops right off, exposing all those drives. Next there's a cross brace in place that actually holds an expansion card riser that has to be removed as well to gain deeper access into the case. The riser card is what allows our machine to actually use expansion cards here in the form of two ISA slots, two PCI slots and one last one with a shared configuration. After that, we can go ahead and extract the hard drive to take a look. It's held on by the usual amount of wiring, although at least the cage itself has a quick release setup in the form of a single screw that allows you to remove the drive fairly easily. Our CPU is hidden under what I'd consider to be a pretty beefy cooling unit for the day, which yes, it's quite dusty. Once it's unplugged, it's held on with a clip design that holds it in place and then a not insignificant amount of old cooling paste. It does finally give way, allowing us to extract the CPU itself. And that CPU is a Pentium 150MHz lacking any of the MMX instructions. Slotted into a Socket 7 socket, it runs at a bus speed of 66MHz. Not the rarest or fastest processor to be sure, but also very typical for the era. Speeds that would give us plenty of leverage to handle all of your typical late DOS and early Windows 95 titles. The original configuration of this machine definitely didn't have the whole 80 megabyte of RAM, as that's been added later as we can see by the mismatched sticks here. Memory upgrades were common and our machine was no exception. A quick cleanup with an anti-static brush gets the worst of the dust bunnies out of here. While the machine has been cleaned since its original service time in the 90s thanks to the previous owner, it never hurts to give it yet another once over. So, as you probably noticed by now, there's no external video card on this machine, but it's rather integrated into the motherboard. And in this case, that is an S3 Trio 64V+, which isn't exactly top of the line, but adequate. No 3D acceleration will be taking place here, but it's a very compatible and respectable video chip for 2D gaming. 2MB is the video memory included with sockets to expand it further if desired. S3 was definitely favored by many manufacturers during this time and it's no surprise to see it powering this machine's video output. 
With the parts out and after a quick cleanup, let's speed through putting everything back together. It's time for a montage. Now, like any good home computer from the mid-90s, it was bundled with a treasure trove of software. Packard Bell was definitely on top of that, and I was able to restore the installation of this machine back to the way it came shipped, at least to the best of my knowledge. There are many ways to use Packard Bell Restore Media, and finding just the right combination took quite a bit of trial and error, but I got there in the end. Let's take a look at some of the things that came with this computer out of the box. So like most of the computer manufacturers during the 90s era, they uh, bundled a lot of software with this Packard Bell. Many of them did, and this particular model is no exception at all. We have a bevy of different software pre-installed uh, directly from the factory out of the box, which kind of increases the usefulness of your all-in-one home computer. So we have your standard Windows stuff. We also have some edutainment for kids, uh, things like how to browse the internet safely as a child, for example. There's Kid on Net, which kind of, you know, makes a web browser look a little more <laughs> interesting and familiar for children, perhaps. Um, very, very 90s here, this uh, delightful color combinations, of course. We'll exercise out of that. And some of the software that's on here actually will not work out of the way. Like, for example, here's Kids World, which is a great math adventure, the CD required, which I do not have, unfortunately. We have uh, entertainment, such as uh, Genome, the game, also requiring CD. But we also have the Best of Entertainment Pack from Microsoft, which has you know, your classics like Chips Challenge and uh, Jazz Ball and uh, Ski Free, among others. Microsoft Arcade, pretty common as well, they include these things. Uh, we have some uh, productivity suites, including the Encarta 97 suite, but also, again, needing that CD. Microsoft Money, that's a mainstay of the 90s. Word 97, Microsoft Works. And Quicken. Of course we'll have Quicken. we got some graphics things too. Uh, for example, there's a greetings workshop for creating uh, what I'm assuming is a greeting cards, which again needs a CD. Photo suite. Uh, the list kind of goes on. Uh, there's some utilities for audio as well. Some of the ones that are a little more interesting, I think, are the ones like this, like called CyberCoach, for example. I mean, think about it this way. This was a first-time computer for many people, and it had often like kind of guided experience on how to use a computer. Uh, work with your desktop, send a fax, draw pictures, etc. Or more from the net. 
So the fact they bundle this kind of stuff to make the transition to using a home computer a little smoother. It also includes something else interesting, which is called Navigator Assistant, which is basically like an additional bar here that you get with extra uh, features and buttons. More, it's it's a shortcut menu basically. In open software, do it, shut down. Uh, even though you know personally now it feels like the start menu is pretty simple to use. This sort of um, quick bar, if you will, was useful for a lot of first-time computer users. Um, my ASD, for example, had a little dot that hung around in the corner. Uh, but here, Packard Bell has kind of like a sweeping toolbar instead. So Packard Bell bundled a few of these kind of softwares in here. Uh, we have a library with the manuals, how to register, to track your software, reach out support, you know, things like that. And even a way to kind of simplify the interface and kind of I don't want to say dumb down, but just take away unnecessary features of Windows 95 to make it easier to use for perhaps the average home user of the era. So I think a lot of us cut our teeth on a machine with this sort of software on. So it's a delightful combination of different things that you get in your packet bell. Software is all well and good, but we're here for the games. So let's take a look at a few running on this machine. MAX, or Mechanized Assault and Exploration, which is not a forced acronym at all. It's a turn-based action strategy game published by Interplay. While it may have the trappings of a real-time strategy game, it takes a different approach and goes for a much more methodical angle and allows slow exploration and expansion of your forces. Units and buildings can be upgraded a lot, constantly giving you a carrot on a stick. Pretty uh, addictive despite its somewhat simple trappings and surprisingly deep strategy. A game that pushed the CD-ROM medium even further, Roberta Williams' sequel to the unsettling Phantasmagoria was Phantasmagoria A Puzzle of Flesh. Leaning even further into the body horror themes, it sure got a lot of attention. Long gone are the whimsical trappings of the various Quest series games and it ended up being a poster child both for what the CD-ROM format could deliver as well as people being upset at a video game. Love it or hate it, I'd say it's worthy of the attention it got. Although apparently in the beginning of the game here, it's a wallet finding simulator. Mm, no wallet. Another game that shoots for the moon as far as scope goes. Frontier First Encounter is the third installment in David Brayman's epic Elite series. Put on the spacesuit of a hardened space trucker, space pirate, or space police and live out your space faring fantasies. The game was notoriously buggy on release, which seems to be a common thing with these overly ambitious games. But once you get past that, the galaxy is your playground. Go on and make a name for yourself, pilot.
No need to make a joke about how many times Bethesda can sell Skyrim to us here, but well before they made another open world sandbox fantasy game letting you loose in Tamriel. Daggerfall is the second game in the series, and considering when it was made it may be the most ambitious. The world map is simply massive, and if you put it against other fantasy role-playing titles of the era the scope is astounding. If it delivers on that is another matter, but it's a landmark title. Taking a look at a lighter game, Yoda Stories is a neat little action puzzle game played in a tile-based format. It randomly generates this world each time you play and I spent way too much time in a demo for this back in the day. While there was also a similar Indiana Jones puzzler, this is the one that still sticks in my mind. Simple, fun and very addictive. And yes, there is definitely fully licensed Star Wars music supposed to be playing here, so my apologies for it being so quiet. Feel free to uh, hum your favorite John Williams tune to yourself to set the mood. All in all, it's a great machine of the era, and I think a lot of people got their start in computing on something very similar. But what's next for our Packard Bell? Well, it's certainly more than usable now, but it could definitely use some choice upgrades to truly bring it to the next level. Or should we keep it the way it is and retain the history that comes with it? Of course, it's already been mildly upgraded looking at all those extra drives, as well as the memory. Let me uh, know in the comments if you'd like to see this computer be upgraded with some choice components to truly make it sing. And let me know if you had a machine like this or similar. I was in the AST camp at the time, but I'm curious to hear about your experiences from the era of the multimedia revolution. That's going to do it for the Packard Bell 2980 for this time, but we haven't seen the last of this delightful machine. There's something really special about the multimedia era and its associated computers and software. Stacks and stacks of CD-ROM bundles with the promise of new worlds to explore, all enhanced by the storage medium. Either way, thank you very much for watching. If you'd like this look at the Packard Bell Tower, perhaps you'd be interested in some of my other videos where I take a look at retro PCs. You can find me on my website as well as on social media. Otherwise, catch me live each Thursday at 8.45pm Central, where I stream a variety of retro games. Until next time.